This is Thursday, November 18, 2010. We are in Natick, Massachusetts, and this tape is part of the Morris Institute Library's continuing Veterans Oral History Project. My name is Maureen Sullivan. Our cameraman is Dan McDermott. We are privileged to have with us today Charlotte Lasnick. Welcome, Charlotte. Thank you. Uh, may I ask where you were born? Somerville, Massachusetts, but my parents lived in Dorchester, Massachusetts. And what is your current address? Framingham, Massachusetts. And what is your marital status? With newly widowed. And do you have children? I have one son. When you were a civilian secretary in the Army, when did you begin that? Uh, 1943. And how did you become a civilian secretary? I took the civil service examination mm -hmm. and I passed and I was sent for an interview to the uh, First Service Command headquarters mm -hmm. on 808 Commonwealth Ave. It was the Peter Fuller Cadillac Olds building that was turned over for Army usage at Cottage Farm Bridge, which is now called BU Bridge. Were you under um, Army discipline at any time? No. So you, uh, this was basically an eight hour a day job? Yes. At the uh, beginning, mm -hmm. we had to work on Saturdays also. Mm -hmm. And you took turn with how many other secretaries? Maybe four or five. Four or five. And you went to local Army posts. Can you tell us uh, where you went? Well, the one that has the most uh, significance to me is Cushing Hospital, located in Framingham, Massachusetts. It was, um, uh, I remember vividly walking down endless long corridors, which were lined on either side with patients' rooms, mm -hmm. uh, until we got to the room where our uh, um, return prisoner of war was in bed. Mm -hmm. A young man, I remember what he looked like, uh, he pulled the sheet aside and showed us the burns on his legs and the soles of his feet where the Japanese soldiers had burned him. Mm -hmm. I and took the, mm -hmm. uh, I, uh, the dictation in answer to the interrogator's questions mm -hmm. in shorthand. I filled up a um, stenographer's notebook. Mm -hmm went back and typed out a rough draft as correctly as I could. Then the interrogator went back uh, to the soldier. He edited it for correctness and for blanks that I might have left, then brought it back to me, and I typed eight copies on legal size paper with carbon paper, and uh, that was the uh, finished testimony. He took it back to the soldier or in other cases, if the soldier could come into the office, he read it over, he signed it, and it was notarized. And I believe all these different interviews were used in the Nuremberg War Crimes Trials. Do you remember how many prisoners you interviewed or at least took down the um, interrogation information? Maybe about five or six. Five or six. Uh, Fort Devons, Camp mm -hmm. Edwards, and I don't remember the other places. Do you remember if any of the former prisoners of war came from this area? No, I don't. And what else happened um, with you during the war? Did you go to USO shows? Yes, okay, I went was... to USO uh, dances mm -hmm. uh, where we met and talked with the uh, so, uh, servicemen. Mm -hmm. uh, this was around Boston. The one that I remember most vividly, uh, a girlfriend and I went to um, Rose Wharf mm -hmm. on Atlantic Ave to take a ferry to one of the Boston Harbor Islands for an afternoon dance. My friend was late in starting out. Just as we got to the dock, they pulled away the ropes and there was about a foot of water between us and I was so mad and so upset, I almost tried to jump into the boat over the water. We never got to the dance, obviously. 
when, uh, during the time you were a civilian secretary, were you still living in Dorchester? Yes. Uh, were you still living with your parents? Yes. Do you, did you have any other family members in the military during the war? Yes, I had uh, two first cousins. Mm -hmm. One was in Germany and one was in the uh, Pacific for about five years. I uh, corresponded with them both. And what branches of the service were they in? Uh, Army. Both Army. Okay. Now tell us a little bit more about life on the home front during, during the war. Uh, tell us more about rationing. Well, every person had a, a ration card, probably children also. Uh, we were limited in what we could purchase unless you participated in the uh, black market, which we did not. Uh, sugar was rationed, mm -hmm. meat was rationed, chicken, I believe, poultry was not. Uh, butter was rationed, uh, shoes, mm -hmm. because we only had leather shoes at the time. Mm -hmm. My grandfather, who was elderly, gave me one of his shoe coupons so that uh, I could buy uh, another pair of shoes. Mm -hmm. Uh, the, uh, my mother and aunt went into Boston and stood in line around Feline's Boston department store all around the block to be able to purchase two pairs of nylon stockings each. Two pairs? Each. The nylon was being used for parachutes mm -hmm. and limited for civilian uh, manufacturing and otherwise women wore cotton lyle stockings, mm -hmm. uh, tan color, and I think they had a seam up the back. Okay, let, uh, tell us about air raid wardens. Well, a cousin of mine was an air raid warden. Each little neighborhood had one. He um, walked around the block with a helmet and he had some sort of a pail. I don't know whether it was for fire or cigarette butts or what, and a flashlight. Uh, all our windows in our home had to be uh, uh, covered with black cloth so that no light would shine through. Uh, oh, there was also gas rationing mm -hmm. uh, for cars. There was A, B, and C. My father had a B sticker which gave him permission to buy a little more gas as he used it for business. A st uh, sticker was mainly for the Sunday drivers and C was for those in more um, uh, required occupations and then people did buy gas on the black market. Okay. Let's go back uh, a little bit. Where did you get your secretarial training? Uh, after high school, I went to Boston Clerical School mm -hmm. in Roxbury, Massachusetts. It was a very hard, uh, difficult, secret business school run by the city of Boston at no cost to residents. Mm -hmm. And uh, 90 was a passing grade. And how long did the course take? Well, it took two years, but I had a job opportunity and left it about a year and a half. Mm -hmm. And that job opportunity was? It was a private uh, okay. concern. So that was before you were secretary for the Army? Yes. Okay. And how long did you serve as a civilian secretary? Um, 1943 mm -hmm. through 1945 and in, somewhat into 1946. Okay. And where were you when the end of the war was declared VE Day or VJ Day? I might have still been with the Army, but then mm -hmm. we moved from Commonwealth Ave to the Army Base. And where was the Army Base? Uh, either South Boston or on the borderline with Boston. From mm -hmm. South Station we took a bus and the buildings were A to F and we were in building F right on the water. Right on the water, okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay, so it's now the end of the war. What, uh, were you still interviewing prisoners of war um, after the war? I don't believe so. 
Okay, so what, what were your basic duties um, at that time? Uh, typing, shorthand, filing, sec uh, secretarial, stenographic type mm -hmm. uh, duties. And basically what was that for? Was it just to, uh, for all the mustering out of personnel? Yes, and uh, reports of uh, soldiers' experiences. Mm -hmm. Now, you're still living in Dorchester? Yes. And it's sort of that, now the end of the war. So you meet uh, Abraham, your, your future husband. How did that come about? Well, not quite right away. Not quite I right didn't away. meet him mm -hmm. till 1957. Mm -hmm. I went to a resort for singles in upstate New York in the Adirondacks called Scaroon Manor, and I met some young men from Philadelphia, and they asked if they could give my name and telephone number to their friend in Philadelphia, who now lived up in Massachusetts mm -hmm. in uh, Natick. So mm -hmm. I said yes, and uh, he called me uh, on the phone and we made a date for the Saturday night after Labor Day. Mm -hmm. That was our first date and we went for the afternoon and dinner to Gloucester Rockport and had dinner at uh, Peg Leg a restaurant in uh, Rockport. Mm -hmm. And then we dated spasmodically. He went home to Philadelphia on long weekends and then within the year we started dating more frequently and became engaged in uh, 1959. Okay. Let's backtrack a little bit from the end of 46 to about 57. Uh, what were you doing? I continued to work for the government in various agencies. Mm -hmm. I worked six months for the Coast Guard. Then I worked for the Veterans Administration Adjudication Division on Tremont Street in Boston. Mm -hmm. That was the Veterans Headquarters. And we, uh, uh, typing secretarial work, mm -hmm. uh, they rated the soldiers for their disabilities in the war and awarded them the pensions mm -hmm. commensurate with their injuries. Uh, can you give me a little more information about how that happened, uh, the ratings? Uh, well, the, they filed applications for disabilities, mm -hmm. and uh, most of the uh, higher level people were lawyers, and uh, they read over their experiences and their medical records mm -hmm. and what their combat injuries were and the residues, and then the board uh, rated them according to government guidelines. And they received compensation according to their percentage of disability. Mm -hmm. So at the time you met Abraham, this is now 1957, where were you working? Uh, well, I had a few other jobs in few between. Okay. Six months at the Coast Guard, then the Veterans Administration, and I worked in the loan guarantee office there as well. Mm -hmm. And there the servicemen were entitled to a, um, a loan guarantee at a lower rate of interest mm -hmm. to purchase a home. Mm -hmm. And when we bought our home, the paperwork went through very fast because I had a friend work, still working in that office and she pushed the papers through quickly. Okay. Uh, after that, uh, oh, after the re that was the loan guarantee office. Then mm -hmm. I went to work for the adjudication. I was there a year, uh, and then I changed jobs for a promotion in grade and salary, and went to work for the renegotiation board. Now, tell us more about that. Uh, all the major in industries received contracts from the government for production of everything imaginable. Mm -hmm. After the war, the government went back with these companies and renegotiated the contracts and either added to the money that the, 
company was due, aircraft companies, uh, machine tool companies, and so forth, and they renegotiated the contract. Either the company had to repay money or the government would award money to, uh, for the work that they had done during the war. Uh, it was a temporary agency. I knew that, but I knew that I would have a job for three years, mm -hmm. and I stayed there until it closed. And when did it close? Uh, 1950, June 1955. And what did you do after that? I believe I had another temporary job, and then I was hired by the Regional Post Office Department. Not the Boston Post Office, but the regional that took care of all New England states as secretary to the uh, Space Requirements Officer. They uh, evaluated post offices that needed rebuilding or renovating or expansion. Mm -hmm. And I stayed there until uh, a few months after I was married. Okay. So now let's talk about your husband, Abraham. All right. And he was, of course, a World War II veteran in the Army. Let's show a picture of, of him in his younger days. Now, um, how long was Abraham in the Army? Well, I believe it was under two years. Under two years. Uh, from 1943? Three to mm -hmm. 45. Mm -hmm. uh, after the bomb w bombs were dropped in Japan, uh, he was in, on a ship coming home for a 30-day leave due to be in the second wave invading Tokyo Bay. So he never went overseas again, but he went to several different uh, camps and posts in this country. Okay. But before he was on that ship, uh, he was in Europe? Yes. And what parts of Europe? Uh, Landed in France through Belgium into Germany in what was called the Battle of Famous Battle of the Bulge mm -hmm. and the Bridge at Remagen. And he mm -hmm. always said that if we went back to Germany, everyone who did as a civilian wanted to quote pee in the Rhine. Oh dear. <laughs> now, uh, what unit did he serve with? Uh, the 9th Armored Division. Mm -hmm. He was a tanker mm -hmm. because of his mechanical ability. Mm -hmm. uh, he had previously, before he was uh, inducted, he worked for the government mm -hmm. as a mechanic on aircraft engines, and that's why he didn't go in until later in the war. Okay. And your husband was a real camera bug, wasn't he? Because. Yeah. You brought along this marvelous little scrapbook of items. Let's just gonna see if you can show off some of his camera work here. There we are. Some uh, very detailed uh, shots of him while he was stationed in Europe, uh, pl people, places, and things. Let's just, and that's him right down there. And he has everything marked and tagged. And dated. And dated. Excellent. There we are. Let's just take that back for a moment. So according to his discharge papers, he was um, out of Indiana in 1946. What did he do after the war? Uh, various jobs. He was sort of, um, I won't use the word conniver, but he was enterprising. Mm -hmm. uh, they offered him a job as a cook, which he turned down. Mm -hmm. He liked to eat, and he would have been a good cook, but he didn't want to be cooking. Mm -hmm. uh, he got um, uh, clerical assignments, typing up in the uh, offices at the camp. And I guess that's most of what he did until he was discharged. He was in places in um, uh, Missouri, I believe, mm -hmm possibly the South. Okay. I understand that uh, he came up to um, help establish Natick Labs. Tell us yes. more about that. Well, he worked for the government. Mm -hmm. uh, he went from mechanical work to 
laboratory work. Oh, at this time, before the war and after, he went to Temple University at night mm -hmm. and um, worked during the day and uh, gave his mother his paycheck because mm -hmm. the family needed the money mm -hmm. and uh, as a chemist. As a chemist. And then he seemed to have changed. Oh, I believe due to the chemistry background, he was transferred into the NATO Quartermaster Laboratory, which was paperwork. And what, uh, around what year was that? Uh, in the early 50s. Mm -hmm. So this is when uh, Natick Labs was first established? In 1957, mm -hmm. I believe. Okay. And he was offered a job up here in Natick, Mass. at the Natick Labs. It's had mm -hmm. various names since then, mm -hmm. Soldier Services. Uh, they, um, I believe, closed uh, Washington office. They came up here, and the Philadelphia quartermaster office came up here mm -hmm. and established the Soldiers Center here in Natick. Okay. So it's now 19, around 1957. You've, he came up. He came up. And did he settle in Natick or in Framingham? Uh, no, he lived, <coughs> excuse me, with mm -hmm. a friend who was working at another government installation in Watertown. They shared an mm -hmm. apartment and the friend was getting married. Mm -hmm. And so uh, my husband Abraham, Abe we called him for short, found an apartment in Framingham mm -hmm. at Prescott Gardens, which is now condos. And uh, that's where he moved. And when I met him, that's where he was living. OK. And you were still living in Dorchester? Yes. So you were, uh, you were dating Abe. And were you both still involved in government work at that uh, time? Yes. 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 I stayed with the government until a few months after we were married. Mm -hmm. okay. That was in uh, May 28, 1960. So uh, where did you settle after you were married? Well, we lived with my f mother was no longer living. Mm -hmm. We lived with my father in Dorchester. We owned a multifamily house, and we started looking for a home out in the western mm -hmm. suburbs. We looked in Newton, and that wasn't possible, and neither was Wellesley. We looked in Natick, and then quite by chance, we came across this development in mm -hmm. Framingham, uh, which were newly built houses. Coincidentally, we went to a uh, New Year's Eve party mm -hmm. around the corner from where we're living now, and our car died in front of the empty lot, which later became our house. Talk about fate. <laughs> and uh, it was uh, part of a development, but we had uh, ch um, complete choice of uh, mm -hmm. um, figures and colors and so forth. Mm -hmm. And it became like a custom-made house. So did Abe continue uh, working at Natick Labs? Yes. He did have mm -hmm. some offers to go into private industry, but he turned them down. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't want to leave this area because my father was living. Mm -hmm. And he had a lot of years invested in government work, which would lead to his retirement. So he continued live, uh, working as a chemist at the labs? Actually, no. He became a design engineer because of his engineering and mechanical building. Mm -hmm. uh, he worked in the section uh, where he was responsible for upper body, uh, head, face and chest protection for the soldier. He, uh, they worked on helmets, eye protection, ear protection, face, chest, armored vests. He has 12 patents for his work, but he doesn't collect any royalties because at the time they weren't giving royalties for patents. Now I believe they are. So he has the patent frame, but no money. Uh, he uh, 
worked on, uh, he jumped into ice water. He would never let a soldier uh, take the equipment unless he had tested it first. Uh, he also did some work up on Mount Washington uh, in the weather station there. He would go up for a few days at a time and that may have been where he jumped into the ice water to test the equipment. Mm -hmm. He also has a patent with, for a face mask with Sir Hubert Wilkins, who was a well-known Arctic or Antarctic explorer. Mm -hmm. And they worked on a face mask uh, to protect the soldiers. And he has a patent there, and we have one of the face masks at home. So in the, while he's working at the labs, uh, you were actually raising a child. Uh, when was your son born? Uh, 1965. And his name is? Stephen Lawrence. And what's he doing now? Uh, freelance uh, copywriting and uh, copy, uh, writing and editing mm -hmm. and copy editing. Now, did you or your husband join any veterans organizations? Uh, I didn't, mm -hmm. and he wasn't um, uh, inclined to. Mm -hmm. He also mm -hmm. fought on his own and was able to get compensation for a hearing loss that uh, became more severe as time went on. He says that in the tank, the noise of the tank was very sharp. And he also monitored the radio. And they had to put the decibels of the radio very high over the noise of the tank. And that started his hearing loss. So he got the hearing loss during well, when he was serving in World War II? Uh, he started, yes. Mm -hmm. It wasn't obvious right away. Mm -hmm. He also. Uh, had a broken ankle uh, in the service. Mm -hmm. And when did he uh, retire from the labs? Uh, he had 40 years service. 40 years service. It was about 1980 or 1982. Okay. And what did you do afterward? Well, what he did, he joined a, a small consulting company in Natick of retired Natick Labs employees. Mm -hmm. One man was a shoe expert, one man was a glove expert, my husband was an upper body armor mm -hmm. expert, and then there were a few others, and that lasted for five years as a civilian. Mm -hmm. And then that uh, went out of business. Mm -hmm. After that, a friend told him about this organization out of uh, Pennsylvania called TASA, T-A-S-A, -S Technical Advisory Service for Attorneys. And he went on their roster uh, in his field, which was eye, head, face, ears, upper body protection, mm -hmm. and worked as a um, uh, technical advisor to attorneys mm -hmm. handling these lawsuits. The government was not involved with this. They were motorcycle mm -hmm. accidents, uh, faulty uh, uh, helmet, and uh, people would sue the companies that made all this equipment. Mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, and sustained most of them were either deaths or very severe injuries. Mm -hmm. And he was with them about five years. Okay. And what were you doing during this time? I wasn't working. Mm -hmm. I had left my government job. I had taken out my pension because we figured that I wouldn't be going back to work, mm -hmm. uh, at least not for the government. And I uh, really kept house. My mm -hmm. father came to live with us. He was with us for five years and mm -hmm. then he died. I was a homemaker, a mother and a homemaker. Mm -hmm. My father died in 1970 mm -hmm. and uh, 
my son went off to college mm -hmm. and then came back home for a while and then lived uh, elsewhere in the area. Mm, okay. Now, I understand your husband recently passed away. Yes. Yes, and it's very, our condolences for the Thank loss. Thank you. Now you were, um, you've actually been going through a lot of these items. Uh, yes. What, what have you been doing with them? Well, um, not just the wartime I, I, items, I've been decluttering my home. Mm -hmm. My husband was both an engineer and an artist. He painted, he designed my needle points, he did wood carving, he was very imaginative, mm -hmm. he did paintings of all sorts, art medium, and I've donated the, oh, he did tile work. He made tile tables, very decorative. Versatile. Yes, mm -hmm. very. And all the walls in my home and the decorative pieces I have are his artwork. Mm -hmm. uh, wood carving. Uh, he could take left found found objects, leftover things, and make a wall plaque mm -hmm. out of them. And I donated all the art supplies to the Danforth Museum School. Of, uh, for the use of the students. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of the other work uh, supplies I've donated to Keith Tech. He also donated a lot of items to the World War II Museum in back of Sherwood Plaza, which mm -hmm. is a private museum. Mm -hmm. And uh, I understand I didn't go. He went with my son, and it was fascinating. I believe they even have a tank in the museum. I believe they do. Uh, tell us more about the World War II Museum in New Orleans. What's your connection with that? Um, I saw a write-up of it, and I uh, sent a check for basic membership, and I have a uh, certificate uh, in his name and also in my name. Uh, I get literature from them several times a month. It sounds very well organized. They have tours, they have programs, uh, they have uh, fundraising to enlarge the museum. I don't believe I'll ever uh, go there. I was mm -hmm. once in New Orleans in the summer and it was <laughs> very uncomfortable. Okay. Well, let's go back to your days, uh, in your days as a civilian secretary in the Army. Uh, do you, did you ever keep touch with the other secretaries or with the uh, other personnel? I made, had close friends with uh, two of the women. Mm -hmm. And uh, one is dead now and one, I believe, has memory problems. Mm -hmm. We kept uh, in touch uh, when she married and her children were born and until they moved out of the uh, Boston area. Okay. And what about uh, with did you ever get in touch with any of the other prisoners of war you went to? No, or was that? no. Okay. I don't know where they, what areas they lived in, mm -hmm. and uh, no. And how about any of the military personnel you've worked with? Well, I, if there was uh, publicity in the paper, I would uh, sort of read about it, maybe mm -hmm. cut out the articles. But no, mm -hmm. I did not uh, keep in touch with the uh, interrogators. Mm -hmm. Have you since uh, joined any veterans organizations? No, or, no, I haven't, and my husband wasn't yeah, okay. interested. Mm -hmm. Is there anything else you would like to say? Well, it was a very important part of my life for an impressionable, young, uh, rather sheltered mm -hmm. uh, young lady, mm -hmm. girl. Uh, I have a lot of memories of the work that we did mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I met a lot of interesting people in all my government uh, mm -hmm. work. Is there any memory that really stands out? Well, for the renegotiation board, yes. Mm -hmm. I stayed until the office was disbanded. Mm -hmm. I helped disband it and then I heard from my boss, head mm -hmm. of the section, uh, for possibly 20 years. I would get a birthday card and a holiday card. Mm -hmm. And I believe the other ladies did also. Uh, quite a few years later, 
uh, we took a um, several day motor trip up through Vermont and I called my boss mm -hmm. and he was living in a small town in upper Vermont mm -hmm. and he invited me for lunch the next day. Mm -hmm. It was a town, Shoreham, Vermont, it had 800 people mm -hmm. and he said, now when you come into the town center, you slow down and go very slowly because I will be on the porch waving my hands. <laughs> and uh, 800 people lived in the town. Mm -hmm. And uh, after a while, he moved down south. Mm -hmm. uh, he no longer lived, uh, stayed in that area of Vermont. Mm -hmm. But he was the only uh, person that uh, I really kept in touch with. Mm -hmm. And then one year, my holiday card came back, uh, I guess in an envelope from a lawyer, Mm -hmm. who was handling his affairs to notify me that he had passed away. Let's go back to when your husband was a chemist at Natick Labs. Did you ever visit him at the labs? Not too often. Mm -hmm. Not too often. Do you remember what the labs looked like back then? I sort of remembered what his office looked like. Mm -hmm. uh, we did have access as civilians to the swimming pool okay. on the property. I don't know whether it's still there and still being used or not, but I and my son would go for swimming. We belonged to the, um, they called it the officers club mm -hmm. as civilians. And uh, uh, I would go during the summer to the uh, swimming pool, which was very lovely. It overlooked uh, Lake Chichuat. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'd go for the afternoon and uh, I believe uh, my husband taught my son to swim in the pool. And of course, Natick Labs back then got international reputation for the makers of Tang and- well, Oh, yes. Yes, and whatever the astronauts were eating at the time, but it sounds as though your husband more than did his bit with all the patents. Well, I never met anyone who loved his work as much as he did. Mm -hmm. what, um, what would your husband have thought of the labs now, the Social Systems Center? Uh, well, a lot of the people that he worked for, mm -hmm. uh, for and with, are uh, long gone. Mm -hmm. uh, he did go back a few times to visit, but most of the people had moved on and mm -hmm. younger replacements were hired for the same Mm -hmm. work. He did a lot of actual designing items and testing them mm -hmm. before they went out into the field. They had to be tested. He worked with a contracting officer who uh, the items weren't manufactured at mm -hmm. the lab. They were given out in contracts administered mm -hmm. by the contracting officer to private companies. He did a lot of traveling over the country down south to visit the plants where the soldier supplies were being uh, made. And uh, we made some very nice civilian friends mm -hmm. there. Okay, anything else? Any uh, other comments? Well, as, mm -hmm. as I said, uh, he had opportunities to go into civilian, but mm -hmm. he had too much time invested in the retirement system. Mm -hmm. And uh, so he stayed. And there are a lot of other uh, pic uh, pictures in the mm -hmm. folder, I believe. Okay. Is there anything we haven't asked you or, again, any additional comments you would like to make? No, I think we've covered everything pretty yeah. thoroughly. Uh, he was a very technical person and artistic mm -hmm. and uh, uh, loved what he did. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Charlotte Lasnik, for your participation in this program and thank you, Abraham, wherever you are. <laughs> oh. oh. We almost forgot, of course. This is uh, the wedding picture that was taken in 1960. So, Charlotte, thank you once again. You're welcome, Laurie. Mm -hmm.